Joining me today on the Uniweb interview show, Harlequin Grimm, podcaster, storyteller, author. Um, you you do the uh, Mania podcast, correct, Quinn? Mm-hmm. Yes. yes. Yeah, I'll make I do the Mania podcast. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. I really appreciate it. All the way from Portland, Oregon, mm. across mm-hmm. the world. How's it going today, man? Oh, that was fantastic. Yeah, thank you for for having me on. It's it's uh it's kind of an overcast, dreary day, but it's it's beautiful nonetheless. That's right. Yeah, it's where our, all of our secret desires come out to play. And looking at your website, um, it's kind of dreary as well. You do a podcast based off of uh, horror, correct? Yeah. So it's um, it's horror, but it's it's always rooted in some kind of truth. So it has historical events and things that actually happens. And it'll go from things that are entirely nonfiction. Um, like the first episode was a murder that actually happened and there were accounts of it. But then it'll, it'll go off and into more. Do the mur- were you the murderer? It's if I had a time <laughs> machine, it's possible. <laughs> OK, case, um, the case has been closed on that one. Case is closed on this one. Um, okay. And then we'll have more folklore stuff. But even then, I try to get whatever local tales or retellings there were from that time period. Like I had a Headless Horseman episode. So it's obviously not close to nonfiction, but there's something there. Right? So for, for people who don't know, um, how long have you been actually doing the podcast and how'd you get into this? Well, I started it because of my dissatisfaction with publishing and writing books. Yeah. So the, as a lot of writers know, when you start writing a book, it's ex- extremely, it's a long-term gratification deal. No short-term <laughs> gratification. <laughs> Let's be honest. There's not a lot of gratification at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, it's just like, um, so it's just... It's a, it can be a slog and I wanted something that I could do constantly that I could kind of cultivate and just watch it grow. Yeah. So now the podcast, so I like came... a payoff every. Sure. Like, yeah. In a way. And I also thought about community and interacting with people. And even with a published book that let's say it became popular, even then there wouldn't be as much of a direct contact with people listening and interacting. So I wanted something more alive and that's why I started it. And that was about, I started in October of 2018. Wow. So just, I mean, it's what, like eight months. Yeah. It's a baby. It's a crawling baby right now. I gotta say, man, uh, when you contacted me too, it was extremely professional. Uh, the way (laughs) it really was, it blew me away because I I get a lot of emails, um, and they're not nearly to that level, which was wonderful. Um, and then to see your website too, it's all very professionally done. It looks like it's been in, in motion for a long time and there's been a lot put behind it. <clears throat> Have you, did you do all of this yourself? Yeah, that's all the pain that you're seeing. That's all. all the pain? Um, yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, well, the reason why I, I conduct myself that way is, is first of all, is out of respect to you because what you're doing is you're giving voices to people and you're trying to grow a community. And obviously right. there's going to be hundreds of people there and try to take advantage of that you know it's yeah. a- absolute chaos on on twitter and everything there's like people trying trying to put on try, people trying to put on face saying that they're trying to grow a community but they're not and some people some people are actually being genuine but they're not getting their voices heard and yeah you know we're all trying to get to where we're trying to go and we shouldn't pretend like we're not trying to get something out of our careers that isn't just the joy the joy of our arts um you know, so, you, yeah. you speak on that, too. Uh, I don't want to cut you off, but it's something that has hit me pretty hard uh, recently. That whole striving to get something. It's, it's almost like a manipulation of other people mm-hmm. in the form of or disguised as a community. And yeah. as much as I don't want to let it bother me, it does bother me to my core. <laughs> and I get very... <laughs> Because you know why it bothers me? And this is me being 100% honest. Because they get more attention than me. And I'm just like... (laughs) And I'm like, but I'm doing it for the right reasons. (laughs) Damn it. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah, there is... There is very little justice in the creative world, I think. Yeah. 
you know. Um, so I, I understand that frustration for sure. But even in that, I mean, that's still a self-serving thought. Like, I'm doing it the right way, you know. Right. Like, who the hell knows who's doing it the right way or not? It's like if we had a time machine, like you said, and I could go a thousand years in the future or a hundred years and yeah. figure out, well, see what came out of my me doing what I did and see what came out of them doing what they did, then we might have some perspective. But in reality, I have zero perspective. Right. And there also has to be something to say about just what goes into what goes into our intentions and let's say that uh, so take for example getting getting very popular getting so popular that you can't you can't even respond you're inundated with people interacting with you yeah. um, you know you're probably already experiencing this with your your twitter and that you just can't feasibly with all the time in your day get back to every person that is pinging right. you and if you're if you get JK Rowling level famous, like throw that out the window, right? Like it's it's Absolutely. over. Yeah. So it gets to a point where what you gave to the world, which was you can call it a product, you can call it your art, whatever it was, that's your that's your gift to the community. It gets to a certain point where your personal interaction is no longer necessarily what you're giving to people. Um, and that that poses a lot of interesting questions because at the beginning what we're giving is our is our genuine interaction more on a person by person basis yeah I think. Um, so yeah that's a that's a great perspective and i guess i and hadn't really thought about it like that because i still think you know still think of that as well i'm just you know just this little guy right um i need to interact I, i'm you know it's not like i have i haven't become anything I'm still like, you know what I mean? I should still be able to interact with the community. Like that was the whole point. Like that is my value. And like mm -hmm. learning how to transition our value from something different than just being that one-on-one -on -one interaction. Because JK Rowling isn't responding to anybody on Twitter. <laughs> you know, she's not taking any of her day now. I've, I've yeah. realized this. I've tweeted her a ton. She doesn't. <laughs> she doesn't. Have, have you actually? <laughs> yeah. She doesn't talk back, man. <laughs> really, I've seen her say some some pretty out there things to people. Uh, really? Yeah. Yes. She she told a a person who was trolling her, who was probably 15, 14 years old max, and he, he said something. He said something like. He said something like, "I'm burning your movies or your CDs," um, and she yeah. said, "Like, well, I don't care. I already have your money." It's like. You're doing it. This you're at this level, and you're <laughs> fighting back to troll. Oh, yikes! <laughs> That's vicious. That's but, vicious. So I, I can imagine though, like it, it gets tough to uh, to work anything out mentally, like intellectually, at, at that level of attention. You oh, know, yeah. like when I have four people paying attention to me, I'm just like. <laughs> like, <I> wanna... <laughs> it's exhausting you know <laughs> why no. what is what is the the whole reason you wanted to do this i mean you talk about community what are your intentions behind i mean obviously you, you were you came out frustrated with the publishing process and you want community but like why is a community important to you well it's not just community it's about i think that the core of what what artists do is they they see something in the world and they they have their own way of looking at it and they want to share it with people. And with regards to horror and dark moments, so when I, I write books and I, I'm still querying out novels, but the books I write are also grim dark, so they have a lot of horror aspects to them. Mm -hmm. um, the idea is to sort of to sort of portray and I guess plate suffering in a different way so that people can look at it and have a different perspective on it. Because so much of our lives is filled with, with suffering. Yeah. And basically the theme is that if we can shift our perspectives we can radically shift our experience and specifically with regards to pain or agony or things that we're afraid of especially as artists we deal with a lot of doubt and anxiety and maybe depression yes, yes. <laughs> so i joked I mean, that our, i joked that writing a book is like the wave in a particle of light like we know it's great until we show it to somebody and then we're like, no, it sucks. Don't look. Don't look at it. It's like, yeah. when did it be, when did the particle become a, a wave? You know, yeah. we can't reconcile that in our mind. 
Exactly. There's so much of that. And that's and that's the thing is that 90 percent of a writer, especially when they're just in the beginning phases, 90 or even later, 90 percent of what they're dealing with is in the actual writing process. It's all the mental uh, strain. And so they're not even fighting against the logistical problems they have to deal with, with how to develop a good plot, how to develop good characters. And all these things are going to take hours and days and years to perfect. But before you can even get to that, you have every day that problem of sitting down and getting to do what you're doing between doubt, between fear, and between all these negative emotions. And so if you become amazing at dealing with these negative emotions, then you can spend more time doing what you actually love doing or doing what's actually challenging. Yeah. And I wonder, I would like to help people practice that more. So it's not, that's something you've had to overcome a lot in your life. I'm, sen- yeah. I'm sensing. I don't know for a fact. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> no, this is all conjecture. I don't know what this is like. This is speculation. Yeah, this is all, all speculation. <laughs> I just assume people suffer. I have no, I've never suffered. <laughs> never. I'm always happy. Yeah, this is not a problem for me. This is why I'm helping right. people. So what have, what have been some of the most difficult things in your life that you can touch on that have you've you've grown through? Because, I mean, I think suffering is there for us to grow. It's not there for us just to just to suffer. Right. Just enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, what you uh, that's for sure true. Um, well, I moved out of my home when I was very young. I was barely 17 when I moved out. So I was working terrible jobs and trying to write books while doing full time basically Mm -hmm. minimum wage jobs and everybody deals with time constraints and basically it was just this idea of can i can i write books and try to become an author when i'm this young while experiencing the the radical shift of depending on parents and depending on a, a household to just being independent for the first time and figuring all that out. So food and rent and all of that, and like scraping money together and figuring that out and then trying to write books as well, but then not, not pitying myself for being in that situation. Um, but it was just, it was just way too much to handle. And even though I kept doing it, I was massively depressed and, uh, self-loathing for the first few years after moving out. It's sensory overload to an extent. It's like, and I, I had a conversation with a friend yesterday about this and, um, I, I, it's kind of like if you were to break your femur, like you snap your leg in half. When that happens, the pain is so amazing that you can only <laughs> you can only think of the pain. There's never there's never a thought in your head that's like, this is great. My leg is gonna be so much stronger <laughs> once, <laughs> once this heals, right? You're never like. I can't wait for this fucking leg to heal because it's going to be so great when it's it's going to be strong as hell. It's always, this is overwhelming. I can't take the pain. It's too much. And then shut down, right? Because we just can't handle it. And I think it happens, um, and we don't even realize this, but it happens through emotional uh, stresses, life stresses, that kind of thing. It's not just a physical thing. It happens to us uh, mentally and emotionally. And... Um, but I think like you're like you're talking about getting through the suffering, realizing that, OK, this pain will pass somehow becoming aware that this pain will pass and then I will be able to move forward is necessary. Yeah. And I think it, to a greater extent, it kind of steps forward as well. My, my philosophy with that, which is that we, we always have the benefit of hindsight after the fact and we, we, we look back on everything. And a lot of moments in our lives, admittedly, aren't analogous to breaking our femur. Uh, they will be, for sure, deaths in the yeah. family, things like that, tragedies. But a lot of moments are, you know, not even ankle sprains. It's just right. a slap on the wrist or whatever. But <laughs> because, of, because of how our minds work, we will cascade into these, these pits of doom where we are our own enemies. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're on the ground like, ah! Exactly. And so if we can, if we can have the hindsight of ourselves one week after we freak out or go into chaos for over nothing, and we can have it in that moment, then we can spend however much percentage of our lives that we've normally spend in a state of perpetual mental anxiety or, or um, fear. And we can just enjoy our lives because there's also this idea that happiness is just a pinprick on the human spectrum and it's, it's okay. 
and maybe even fun to explore the human spectrum of emotions and just sort of dwell on each one and appreciate it for what it is. Um, yeah. You know, happy. If we were to sustain happiness for so long, it would, it it wouldn't be the bright and bubbly thing that it is. So absolutely. And the, yeah, what are we here for if not to experience, right? Yeah. And to only experience one aspect of our human nature would be kind of a waste. Yes, exactly. So, especially in our in our Western society, there's this rat race for happiness, and it's, it's super intense, and arguably what what leads to a lot of the depression. And Actually, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was, comparison is the thief of joy. I think that's the phrase. Yeah. So, people. It's funny that we do that too, though. And I, I've recently given up. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because it is, it's like you chase. It's I, I call it false finish lines. Like we're always, yeah. and it, it, when you talk about the the uh, gratification of publishing a novel, I had that in my mind that once I get this novel written, I'll be something, and I publish it, then everyone will know that I'm not a failure and I'm some somebody to be taken note of. <laughs> and when nothing happened, <laughs> when, I, when I published it, <laughs> and I was like, wait a second. <laughs> 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 I, thought light, I thought light was supposed to come flying out of my friggin' ears or whatever, and nothing happened. Um, it was that realization that, oh, it's all about just the journey. It's about every aspect of what went into writing the book, about what goes into every part of my life. It's not about the feeling I get from the thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, exactly. So with your writings too, and is that something you explore a lot? I mean, with horror, I know obviously you're writing about fear. Are you exploring your own personal fears and attempt to overcome them before they happen <laughs> in real life? <laughs> before I get murdered. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, I think, I, I just think it's, well, it's really fun. It's very entertaining for me. But the the show takes that, Whole philosophy and just kind of breaks off one branch of it and the show talks about how the quote so the theme of the show is this is this line i wrote uh within every nightmare's heart is a crying infant and with every monster's soul is a child helpless this idea that if you were to take the worst people in our world so hitler or stalin or anybody a serial killer you wind back the time to when they were a three-year-old crawling on the ground or they were a child they would be as as innocent and innocuous as anything, and that yeah. there's this there's this sort of whole unrolling of of fate, and I think that evil and wrongdoing and all the things that we associate with it uh, are really misunderstood, or at least we have really archaic understandings of it, right? Um, so I don't sympathize with people who do horrible things, right? I don't excuse their behavior. But I think that their perspectives are really ignored. And I think that is a tragedy for writing and art in general, that we ignore this, this gigantic spectrum on average, which is people who, who are, are portrayed as evil or are evil or do something bad. Um, and that their perspective, too, we can be flexible and work around it to learn from it, the same way that we learn from our own, our own misery, our own pain, and come out of it wiser. Yeah, and I, that's interesting because it is like, to what extent then am I allowed to make a mistake and become something different, right? Because if I'm judging this person on what they did in that moment for the rest of their life, then that's a standard that I also have to hold to myself. And then I, I in, inadvertently trap myself in that way. Right. And then it yeah. becomes like this sick cycle of I can never be anything more than I am right now or at my worst moment. Yeah. Yeah. And that's tied to all kinds of weird philosophies like determinism is really fascinating for me and, and uh, the argument against free will and things like that. So I explore concepts like that in the podcast a little bit. Yeah, it is interesting to think of uh, Hitler as a baby. <laughs> You know, that is weird, right? Because yeah, you only imagine him as a, a murdering psychopath, right? That yeah, just wants it, the death and destruction of everything. And it's absolutely inexcusable. Um, 
but we there's a there's a certain point where if you take if you take someone's free will out of the equation so uh, Hitler or anybody else as a baby and you're just analyzing moment by moment all the variables in their life that conspire to make them who they are when they're 18 or 19 eventually doing these horrible things and cascading into this into this murderous plot okay so we can clearly see what what led them to be this person and we can't there's certain times where we can't even blame them the same way that we don't necessarily blame somebody who is uh, schizophrenic for hearing voices right right, right? We, like that's something they're born with um and so that's a philosophy that isn't really fondly looked after the idea that we ne we may not necessarily have free will uh in the authorship of ourselves and um, so but it's it, it's definitely something to be to be looked at because there's, there's clearly some evidence for it um at least to think about it yeah, and I think what you're touching on too is a lot of kind of what the whole world is is coming to the point of what does it even mean to be human? Like at what level is it do we stop becoming human? Because and there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on now politically with that in mind. But um even with the the you know, the LBGTQ community, um, mm -hmm. what does it mean to be like um, are, am I still a part of the human race because I identify as this, this, or this? Right. Um, and we forget the perspective of we were all, we were all just these little balls of crap, <laughs> you know, <laughs> something like that. Like even you know, we we go immediately with the evil perspective of well, Hitler was a baby, right? But what about when like a Buddha or Jesus was a baby? Did they not like throw up after a feeding at some point? Like still making exactly. mistake still human um and we can we confuse our humanity for um evil or, or righteousness when it's just the way we were created and there's nothing wrong with that right it just yeah. is right it just is yeah it just is and we as we as a society and a culture will have to make decisions about excommunicating people from our societies when they get to a point of, of being so toxic. So we can say, hey, it's not your fault that you murdered 20 people, but we're not going to let you into our society anymore. Right. Right. We don't want you so, to murder any of us. <laughs> yeah. So the, the huge the huge takeaway is that we can we can be rational with how we deal with these individuals, but we don't have to hate them. That's the sure. big thing uh, is that we don't necessarily have to hate them any more than we would. Uh, you know, people in the past would see somebody with a mental illness and think that they're a witch because they're muttering to themselves and they would they would burn them at the stake or do horrible things to them because they don't understand them because they hate them, right? But that person had a mental illness or perfectly rational explanation. And we don't always have to go to Hitler, but we have, you know, way more um, way more benign cases. Somebody who accidentally commits manslaughter, for example, we right. could, or does it repeat it a number of times, we could say, well, we, you're clearly not a good individual to have society, but we don't have to hate you for all the events that conspire to make you who you are right now. Right. And so we can just be left with compassion and just feel feel sympathetic that that person got to this point in their life at all we don't have to hate them though and that for me is um that's the big takeaway we don't have to hate uh our monsters and our our demons it, it really comes back to we fear what we don't know like what we can't what we can't comprehend personally we are terrified of like and, and there's there's subjects that are harder to talk about for people because they're harder to conceptualize like god is a very difficult subject to speak about because what the fuck right <laughs> like well, how do you conceptualize uh unlimited everything mm -hmm. you can't right so that uh, that is like creates a fear of well i can't put it into words that make sense and make me feel smart so I hate it. And I'm not going to talk about it. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing with like money, sex, politics, all this kind of stuff that we can't necessarily wrap our minds around. Mm -hmm. It turns into like a fear and then it turns into hate. Yeah. Yes. Completely agree with that. Yeah. That's, that's, that's such a, that's such a one, like a wonderfully dark theme of, of, of humanity is that we fear what we don't know and we do terrible things to <laughs> keep ourselves from facing it and figuring it out. Uh, we're better off killing this person. Trust me. Just burn them. We'll figure Trust it out me. I don't later. Get them. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so my anecdote to this and to to 
to suffering on a large scale because you can kind of mirror what we don't know, what we fear with our inner psychological torments and our emotions. That's my idea, at least. That's what I think, is that the antidote to it is curiosity and just yeah. being curious and very, being very playful with all these things that we're not certain of. And so yeah. we feel massively depressed one day for no reason or we wake up and uh, we're, we're, we're feeling these bizarre way over the top, way over the top, dark thoughts, um, instead of heavily considering them, kind of being curious with where that came from and, and what is their contents. And if we, if we see an individual who's doing a practice or let's say we're in 1600s, they're doing a spell that we don't understand, you know, instead of judging them, what if we were just curious and we just had a conversation with them about what they were doing, right? It would, curiosity is sort of, I think, the antidote to a lot of, a lot of negative reactions to these things. Mm. Absolutely. No, I, I totally agree with that. But with the curiosity, we have like we have to become open. And I feel like there's such a fear of I've spent my entire life acquiring this information to build this opinion. And my whole life is set up in such a way that if my opinion changes about this thing, then everything else will crash down around me. Right. And it's it's still it's still the fear of but I did all of this. How can I change now? And I think more and more it's happening that we're learning to let go of all the crap that we think is important in life, like all the possession and all the things that we were told, like the American dream in a way. Mm. Um, and just waking up with the, okay, I'm going to keep an open mind today. If I see some weird crap on the streets, <laughs> maybe, maybe don't judge it immediately. Or even if you do, ask a question afterwards why are you doing that <laughs> you know because it is I, I i totally i totally agree with what you're saying that curiosity is so important um to help us understand the human experience yeah. well what, what you were saying is 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 very true too and that's a huge thing is that if you were raised in a certain religion and you had 60 80 plus years of of this was your your answer your guideline to understanding your reality the nature of your consciousness was the guidelines from this this religion or this belief and how are, how do you ask that person to step away from that and consider something else it's you know it's it's difficult um it's extremely difficult and yet we're we're repeatedly approached by situations in our life uh, where they impose themselves on us in such a way that we realize that reality that we were living was just not a reality shared by everyone else uh, we just we have to just accept that we are constantly building up our own castles and forts. Um, but we also have to be open to what somebody else's reality looks like. And that's a, that's a weird thing. That's bizarre. It's difficult balance. It is because we, at the same time, like we have to be open to the, the things we consider weird. We also have to be open to the things that were considered normal. Like, a person who wants whose life has worked out for them exactly how they wanted it to based off the beliefs they've had mm -hmm. it's not my job to run in and fix them they're not right. broken you know there's nothing they're, they're not broken in, in any sense um like kind of what we've been talking about in all of this is learning to allow other people to experience their life however it's being experienced yeah I, I mean, it's okay also just that. not it's tough, man. You know, okay, well, being okay with it, and, and just it's not even it's not even feasible or helpful in a in a community to to walk into a room and say, okay, this is all bullshit. This is bullshit. I'm going <laughs> to yeah. tell you why this is bullshit. Yeah, <laughs> it's not even it's though not helpful. No, even though we want to. Right. Yeah, yeah. It it never gets us anywhere because no. people don't want to be told what they are doing is wrong, ever. Right. We all we all want to be right. Um, it's so interesting because I, I, I assume you're still pretty young. You look young that you're, you're thinking on this level. Um, and you're, you're staying, you know, this open to, uh, creating a life for yourself. It really does. I mean, pain is a painful thing, obviously, but having to have experienced it the way you have, um, has obviously led to greater understanding. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. It's it's, I think it's something that we can. It's a lesson we can learn, right? To not be afraid of of the pain, but we can, we can grow from it. 
Yeah, I think we have to catch it early on in life. Earlier the better. Like, I haven't really been through that much. Like, I am young. I'm 21. So, right. um, I haven't been through that much. And so it's, it's weird for me to speak on these topics because this is just how I understand it. You know, for all I know, in a few years, it'll change. But this is generally what is what has gotten me some consistency and some clarity of mind despite having bi bipolar 2. And mm -hmm. so I kind of overcame that with these philosophies and with these practices. And and that's many, many months and, and a few years of just practicing sort of these these consistent, I guess, modules of mental clarity when it comes to approaching situations of discomfort. Yeah. Well, I mean, so the the long haul here i mean what what are you hoping out to get out of uh the podcast with what you're doing with the writing um do you have do you have goals set out for yourself that you'd like to see yourself achieve by 31 years old or 25 oh, or yeah well i i would love to get to a point where the, the podcast is generating some kind of some income obviously That'd be yeah. fantastic, um, but so there's that. I would love to be self-sufficient independently as a as an artist. Um, I suppose that's a that's a very superficial uh, goal. Do you, do you mean achievements or goals that are, it's, are well, outside of that? Well, it's superficial, but it's also necessary. So it's, it's like completely necessary. You yeah, <laughs> like you, you need to survive. You can't burn on both ends, you know, when you're right. when you're 40 years old, the way I am right now. Um, so yeah, there's that, right? Yeah, working trying to do this, it's it, it becomes overwhelming. Absolutely, I've, I've had to give up a lot. My my social life and the amount of people I spend time with outside of my work, and then my work at home, and then my 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 one or two hobbies that I do outside to fulfill some sort of feeling of of just satisfaction with doing something outside of success. Right. Between those three things, I'm my time is, you know, it's like 20, 30 minutes here or there that I don't know what I'm doing. And that's about it every day. Yeah. But I, I'm sure you've probably heard this a lot. Um, there's a lot of speakers that talk about it, about if if I could have just sacrificed my 20s and like the time where I had so much energy into creating something like you're doing now. Because I, I see this in so many people I've talked to and all the authors I've talked to, the greatest superpower in history is perseverance. It, yeah. Honest to God, it will erode any obstacle in your path as long as you keep going. You know, and you'll build the thing that you want to build if, if you and that's a completely human superpower, but it is a oh, superpower, a hundred percent. Absolutely. For sure, because it it's is hard superpower. as hell to get. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Discipline and, and perseverance are massive superpowers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, it's difficult though. Um, you know, when you're, a lot of people don't know what they want to do when they're in their twenties, and it, right. it's it's so. So I recently joined. Uh, this is an anecdote, sort of about that. So I recently joined the studio where we do we do aerial fitness. Aerial fitness is. Um, uh, like trapeze and silks and uh, the apparatuses that you see in circus performances. And so that's yeah. one of my hobbies that I do. And uh, sort of in that genre is ballet dancing. Uh, right. It's sort of a, just because it's it's body movement and it's about looking beautiful and graceful. And mm -hmm. so you have to have a lot of uh, physical endurance to do that. But some uh, professional ballet dancer said that uh, I was asking somebody else if I was too late to start doing, to become a professional aerialist, if I ever wanted to do that. Um, and somebody said that in the ballet world, this one professional, she said, oh, don't worry about it. This person started when they were 14, as if this was super late. As if 14 was this, like, yeah. late bloomer. Ugh, 14 years old to be a ballet dancer. Man, she, she came got in her with stuff her together. Walker. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, how are you supposed to know the extent of your career, your passions, and your fulfillment? Like, it just is absurd. Yeah, you know, if there's a superpower that's not reliable in terms of attaining it by choice, it's knowing what you're going to do and what you want to do when you're 13. Yeah, and, right. and you know, uh, one of the one of the other things um, too with that is 
being and we're talking about being open about things too it's like being willing to allow your passions to change yeah. there's nothing wrong with that you know absolutely nothing wrong with that like you could become the greatest ballet dancer or just a good ballet dancer from the age of 14 to 18 and then your passion changes and you want to do something different and it's just like we were talking about the the pinpricks like a pinprick of happiness experiencing why would I spend, my, I spend my entire life only experiencing one form of art or joy like I had to get away from thinking that Matt you're a writer because right. a writer isn't performing on stage or you know performing in front of a camera like I also want to act I want to do a lot of other things if I say I'm just a writer well then I'm going to be sitting at my computer writing right kind of boring sometimes isn't that it is, kind of, it is kind of boring sometimes. Man. <laughs> it's it's boring in the sense that what also made me want to do the podcast was, yeah, this exact situation. I'm thinking, what if I achieve my wildest goals as an author and I'm writing full time, I'm just writing books, I'm just spewing them out. Think, fuck, I'm going to want to do something else every now and then. So, yeah. man, so <laughs> I had to start getting on exploring that idea and kind of just saying, okay, let's not be so myopic. Let's explore other forms of expression. And yeah, that's a, it's a huge thing. And people let go of it because it's a part of their identity. They don't want to let go of it. Um, you know, if somebody decides I want to, I'm going to be a writer and all of a sudden they're so attached to this idea or want to be anything and they'll do it. But at the same time, there's something to be said for mastery and that yeah. we are only, we're only alive for so long. And if you want to be a, a history making master at something, typically that means you would devote your life to it. Right, which so it's just to some capacity, and I think you can do it with a few things at once, maybe three, like three or four main things. But you will have to sacrifice a lot: sleep and social life, and um, yeah, maybe romance. Yeah, because the, you really can chase something down to infinity in, in right. everything, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it really is just kind of. Go being, you know, figuring out, are you okay with that or not, and yeah, and allowing that to change, if you want to, because what, what what pillars are you really building your life on? Yeah, exactly. So what made you feel like okay, I'm gonna get away from writing. I'm gonna do more, more performance, more outreach, more, more giving with my voice. Well. So for writing, for me, it first started because I, I, I wanted to, I want to inspire and motivate people, but I, I wanted to make them laugh. It's something I'd always done, um, but I was too, I was terrified to be actually in front of people. So I thought, well, writing is easy. I, I don't have to see anybody. I can just write, and, mm -hmm. and you know, they can read the book and be entertained that way. Once I did that, it was the most freeing experience ever, because I, I like transcribed all of my darkest feelings into the book. And it set me free, you know, mm -hmm. to where I thought I want to I want to hear other people's stories like, holy crap, I just wrote this. Like my story, I think, is is life changing for me. I think other people's are as well. And I was terrified to do this, man. Like this happened. This started four months ago for me. And really it was four months ago. Wow. Yeah, and I've done over 100 interviews now. Um, and it's, it's, it's been insane. I've been in, on, in front of a camera every single day for four months. The fear is completely evaporated, but it also <laughs> completely it's gone. But it also like it reminded me I love to entertain people. I love to be silly and goofy and do stuff. I don't have to peg myself down to just being a writer because that's where it started. Like I can allow things in my life to grow into other things. And it's mm -hmm. just taking a leap of faith, you know. And and li honest to God, just kind of following inspiration and allowing it to happen because it was it was inspiration that said, hey, would anybody be interested in me interviewing them on a, my YouTube channel that didn't exist <laughs> at the time? <laughs> it didn't exist when I asked the question. It existed the day after, and that's what was born of it. But I just listened to the inspiration, and I wasn't, I was, I didn't judge it, you know, because we, I can do that a lot. I'll judge the inspiration when it comes to me as opposed to just leaning into it and see where it takes me. And I, I do that. I still have trouble with that sometimes when I write. Is I'll mm -hmm. judge it before it's the whole idea is fully fleshed out, or give it time to breathe. You know, and I think that is the heart of a creative spirit is 
become the art, let the art just come out of you, don't judge it, and then see what other people make of it. This is yeah. what art is, right? It's like, let's see how it inspires somebody else. Certainly. Yeah, so that is that is a big thing, is the sort of just this uh, uh, letting, it to con- letting it consume you is, is a big thing that I think people can miss out on, for sure, is they get distracted with what they would like it to become or, or what they would like it to do for them, how I'd like to open up avenues in their lives. But if you can sort of throw yourself into your art, whatever it is, or your practice or profession, whatever that may be, and just kind of let it consume you, yeah. I think that, that it can really do a lot in developing whatever it's meant to become. Yeah, I have the saying that um, stop trying to be good at the thing and just get lost in it. You know, because when we get lost in it, we will naturally attain whatever skill set is required of it because we're so into it. But like the idea of being good at it can get me stuck on, am I better than him? Am I better than him? And then in the comparison game never works out. Yeah. I mean, it is a, it is a fool's game. That's what it, it is. feels like. I try, not, I try not to be a fool as often as possible. <laughs> <laughs> I just sort of embraced it. Like, okay, yeah. here we go. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know you, was, have, yeah. you have the jester hat. I do. I have a tattoo on my arm as well. It's a reminder. I sort of gave up. This is, idea that I, this is an idea where I, a long time ago I, I, I wanted to be lofty, very smart and uh, wise, intellectual, and kind of just realized that if you get rid of that bullshit and you kind of accept that you don't know too much and you go into situations assuming that you don't know as much as you know, you'll end up learning more as a result. So the idea of kind of being the fool, being curious, and being open to falling is, I think it's empowering because you immediately surrender the fear of failure and the, the fear of making a mistake. You're okay making an idiot out of yourself. You're okay being an amateur at something. Yeah. It's one of the wisest things I've heard, man. It, it is because, okay. yeah, not knowing... Or knowing that you don't know anything is like the key to learning. Right. Yeah. It's um, it's a weird paradox. <laughs> it is. And I've I've talked to people about this before too, of um how it's it's not ego that allows me to do any of this in front of a camera or get up on stage now and do anything. It's you honest to God, like humility in the form of I have no clue what I'm doing. I'm just, uh, I'm okay with being a screw up and knowing that I will mess up. Right. And in that humility, I can get up and do anything. Yeah. And we feel a lot of gravity with our decisions to do things, to get up on stage or to, to start a new, a podcast or a show on YouTube or to embark on anything. We feel the gravity of this decision and we forget that even if there were a million eyes on us and we, and we completely fell on our ass and made a, and made a shit show of it. it <laughs> yeah. What does it matter, right? What does it yeah. really matter in the grand scheme of things? You're still going to wake up the next day, have some coffee, think about some shit that Trump did, or, you know, like, <laughs> you're still going to have your normal day in the morning. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, in the in grand scheme of things, the consequences of, of our actions in terms of, in terms of success, in terms of how other people see us, that is extremely psychological, and I don't think that needs to be felt in you know like a very physical way. Um, and that's important to helping us have the courage to take that step and get on the stage and and do that new thing. That it's okay if we make an idiot out of ourselves, even if there are there's nobody watching or millions of people watching. So all right. And that's another thing too, man. Like doing this, realizing how hard it is to get an audience. Like. People are so occupied with everything. Like, do you have any idea how difficult it is to get like one person to watch something you do or read a book? Absolutely. It's, it's, almost, <laughs> it's almost impossible. <laughs> yeah. I have started to brainstorm guerrilla marketing tactics for the podcast um, of what I'm going to do like in person because we think about what we're going to do online all the time. And I think, okay, what am I going to do? What am I going to do in person? Put on a spectacle for people to get people to hear about this this thing. I'll tell you what. Even even the people I interview sometimes don't even watch the interview. 
I'm sure. Because I'm sure. they get in their own head about it and they get terrified. And it's like, you, this was for you. <laughs> like, <laughs> So, it, it, but it's a it's a testament to just do whatever the hell you're gonna do. Like if it lights you up and turns you on, go for it. Because probably nobody's gonna see it. <laughs> yeah. So what are your what are your guerrilla marketing techniques that you're working on? I'm interested in in what what you have going on, man. Because I, I where you're at now, I can I can like. And what you have going on right now, it, you you do look like you have a good up, upward trajectory going on. I can see the yeah. light in your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the light. Are, are you mistaking that for the the exhaustion? It might be it. It might be pink, it might be pink eye. I don't know. It might be pink eye. Um. Yeah. Well. So the whole the whole theme around my stuff is um, is exactly what we're talking about as being a fool. So I have a jester hat. It's a very big part of my personality is my jester hat. And I'm thinking about just completing that outfit. And there are some fairs that go on in Portland. And I'm thinking about putting on a costume. I know how to juggle. I know how to ride a unicycle. I can do all kinds of random shit. I think, and I think, about, I think everyone in Portland knows how to do those things, right? That's actually very true. <laughs> 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 shit. <laughs> if I do that, people will just bring out their own. What are you doing? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I have, I've also just thought about literally bothering people and just being a nuisance in public um, and just throwing business cards at people. Street performing, man. Exactly. Um, you know, people do... Like, on the internet, it's really easy to be, you know, vivacious and, and alive and crazy or whatever. But if you can do that in person and leave a mark on somebody's... And actually be an interesting part of their day, how amazing would that be? So Yeah. That's where the real fear comes in. <laughs> oh yeah absolutely yeah. because it does become oh my god if i piss this person off too much they could kill me <laughs> right but then that's good because if somebody catches that on camera you're viral in a second so that's fine virally dead <laughs> <laughs> you're assuming that i couldn't defend myself in this scenario which is yeah i mean you do have insulting i mean you've got juggling techniques and uh unicy unicycle skills i can imagine you're quite the martial artist as well. You haven't heard of unicycle jujitsu? You haven't heard of that? I haven't, man. Is I, it can a... do, I can do an arm bar with a unicycle. Nice, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should start teaching classes on the street how to, how to kill people with unicycles. That's like, that's Portland's been waiting for. It really would. That was, yeah. I don't know why I'm doing the podcast. I could just open up my studio and just train people how to do that. There you go. Defend okay. yourself with your unicycle. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic, man. So when are you planning on getting out there and actually doing the thing? Do you have a date set? I'm thinking about doing it more late, late summer. I haven't completely figured it out yet, but I'm pretty bent on it because I I love developing my my personality online and through my writing, but I would I would love for it to be more part of my life where I'm comfortable being that person in person. Yeah. Right. So I'm thinking around maybe July and August. There. Some of the some of the greats started on the street, man. I just went and saw Eddie Izzard uh, the other day, and uh, he started out doing improv and stand up on the street corners in the UK, just like because there was that love for it, you know, that love for entertaining and connecting and, and doing that kind of stuff. But the like, you got to be, you have to be a little bit insane, right? Um, you have to. Well, the character you're playing has to be a little bit insane to make it happen, because a normal person isn't. Riding a unicycle, juggling, throwing cards at people. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> from my uh, from my research, from my extensive research, that's just not what normal people do. <laughs> <laughs> Take that into consideration. <laughs> that's good. I love the idea, though, man. And I'm really, really excited for you to to see um, all of this grow and in what direction it's going to take for you. Well, it'd be great. I, I love that we connected too because it's all about building each other up. So that'd be yeah. fantastic if I could help build you up too in your community. I think that's fantastic. Absolutely, man. Yeah, one person helping another. I think that our uh, getting to experience things and then be of service. Like all the great teachers of the past have talked about love, tolerance, and being of service to others. And if we can't figure out that, hey, we're, we're here f to be in relationship to one another help one another and we're really missing the point like 
literally yeah. i'm in relation to everything around me right now like if my ass didn't realize it was in a relationship with this chair i would fall out of it you know what i mean like i'm in a relationship regardless of whether i want to be or not can i be of service to the things i'm in relation and, and to another human being that experiences things the exact way i do like that's the most fundamental way of being in a good relationship with another person yeah yeah, absolutely. Um, and a lot of people don't realize as well when they when they start an entrepreneurial business or uh, an art of some kind, they don't realize that pretty much everybody, even Shakespeare at a level, were they were the way for them to attain some kind of success also started with really making these these very fine-tuned decisions and actions within their their communities with people and just yeah. having discussions with other people and building up those relationships. It doesn't, it really doesn't look like going from zero to one, to 100 out of nowhere. Usually sometimes it does, <clears throat> but usually not Yeah. for most people, for most people it's not. So there's a, there's a natural incentive just from the benefit of, of having positive relationships and discussions like this, where it feels, it feels good. It's beautiful for both people. Um, but then there's also the more, logistical benefit of it where you're building your community and your audience and and so it's a it's a twofold benefit um and i don't always want to look at things as if they're either helpful or not um in that way but as so far as insofar as writers and artists might be you know listening to this you can't you can't expect people to just give you handouts for for your yeah. product or your art out of nowhere you have to be a contributing valuable member of whatever culture you're in yeah and, and it's like this too it's I, I equate life to breathing and because it really is it's like i have to be willing to let go of what i have inside of me so that i can take in another breath if i hold on to it i will die mm -mm. so i have to be willing to blow it out so that i can breathe it back in you know and trust that it's there and that's with everything like i have to be willing to give of whatever i have of my skill set uh, my personality uh, my time, my experience, whatever it is, be willing to give of it in the faith that somehow it will come back because it's already coming back to me, whether I want to believe it or not. It's already here. I just have to be willing to accept it and see it for what it is, you know? And I, that is what art is about, giving and receiving without judgment. Yeah. And that's an extremely rare thing, even though a lot of artists artists and public figures or whatever will experience that it returning like for example I, I we would never have had this discussion unless you had done what you had started to do right right you know i had to go through your website and your form and everything and that was a strange process it's so weird to think about human behavior going you know doing all of that right out yeah. of nowhere um but it would never have happened if you hadn't put yourself out there and then it would never have happened if i didn't want to also put myself out there and also be part of your community and so it's strange how these these chain reactions start but there's a lot of people that just will, won't experience that in such a direct way it's a very specific role to be playing it's a very specific action um it's yeah it's really bizarre you know people getting back to you like just just the other day i mailed someone a mug from a giveaway yeah and it was just this weird feeling like i'm just mailing this stranger or something out of nowhere right <laughs> and like here's a book <laughs> right and then i had to and then so at some company was making the mug as well and it was just it's just like humans are whack <laughs> it's bizarre. Bizarre. it is the human process is an extremely bizarre thing when you break it down yeah it's best not to try to break it down <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 best it's a little, yeah it's like it's like trying to break down god or, or the ocean water molecule by water molecule it's overwhelming and then we get caught up in it and i wrote this piece called swallowing the ocean the other day just about that it's like you don't have to swallow the ocean just enjoy the waves you know <laughs> not, it's not your job nobody asked you to drink the damn water <laughs> you know but in trying to control the universe i think i need to drink the entire ocean to make that happen it feels that way it feels that way yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be that way. We're always in a we're, we're always in a constant just like variation of getting out of our own way. 
It's like, oh, that's so true. That is so true. Yeah. Constantly, yeah. Our obstacles are so rarely our actual professional logistical obstacles. It's so yeah. much more psychological all the time. And when it is just purely the problem we have to solve, we're usually pretty good about solving it as long as we're getting to it. Yeah, uh, it's usually not the actual problem. And I think um, being able to have conversations with other people who are on the same path is a crucial part of realizing, oh, the only problem is me. <laughs> right. like we become we become mirrors for one of one one another in that way. We see that oh, I'm making this difficult. Not the action, not the thing I, I'm perceiving as an obstacle. Yes, yeah. And sometimes I think about what I what I do or what anyone else does, and I'm I'm inspired by all kinds of of uh, creatives, and it doesn't really matter what medium it is. So when I think when there's very specific aims with the themes of you know a podcast or a novel, right? I'm trying to yeah. talk about this very specific experience or this fear or something along those lines, but at the same time also just realizing that you just contributing that one object of creation to this humanity's library, this ever-expanding infinite library of creation, that since we're, most of us are all inspired by random things, you just having that object out there that someone can look at, like, oh, that was also another thing, and I'm inspired by that. You know, If you go yeah. to a circus performance, you're inspired by that. If you go to a stand-up comedian, you're inspired by that. If you go to an art show in a gallery of a painter, even though you don't paint, you could be inspired by their dedication. And so just seeing another example of dedication and discipline in any medium is inspiring for a lot of people. So yeah. it doesn't even have to be thematically relevant to their life. Sometimes it doesn't even have to be. Sometimes it can just be an example of discipline. That's it. And that's huge. So sometimes when I remind myself of that, I say, okay, what am I trying to tell people specifically? But more broadly, I'm just contributing to this library and that's, that can be what it is. Yeah, and then it, in a way is reminding ourselves of why we're doing it in the first place, right? Not because of the fame, the wealth, the like things that we're going to acquire, but the discipline of actually doing the thing that we love that, in essence, inspired us in the first place. Yeah. Yes. And get, for, the, hell, uh, get the hell out of my way, Matt. <laughs> like, <laughs> you weren't doing it for any of that stuff. You were doing it because you were inspired. Just do it. Yeah. And I think also the... I'm not, I'm not sure if it is the same for you, but I, I also it helps me make more sense of my reality. So that's a that's a piece for me is that it's it's a way of making sense of how I see things as well. Because I don't know, you know, you don't know what you think until you write it down. I didn't I didn't write that. Who somebody said that before? But um, <laughs> I'm sure so I'm not did. I'm not plagiarizing that. Somebody's did say that before. Um, yeah. But yeah, you don't know what you know until you write it down. Somebody said that. That's very true. And so I think that when you have a, have a discipline for an art, you're slowly but surely understanding more about yourself and in turn how you take in reality and consciousness. And that's, that's, um, that's very clarifying. Uh, it makes for a lot of peace of mind when it comes to just different obstacles coming your way, I think. Yeah, absolutely, man. Dude, this has been, this has been a lot of fun getting to talk to you, man. You're, uh, you're, I, you're, it's, I, I talk about being awakened and like having this um, just idea of being awake. It's, you, I can see that in you, which is cool, um, oh. seeing somebody so young that you just have an open mind, you know, and you're processing it. You're not letting it overwhelm you, which is great. Um, Harlequin Grimm. Why is that hard to say? Harlequin, Harlequin Grimm dot com is where they can find podcasts, your stories, and everything about you. Correct. Correct. Very correct. Well, I'm I'm very excited to continue uh, seeing your path moving forward. I will give you the last word here, uh, and tell the people watching whatever you want. So go. It's all you. What whatever I want. I have the stage here. That's right. Let's see. I would say, whoever's listening, if you have something pestering you in the back of your head some kind of passion or desire to do something but you haven't been doing it for whatever reason um, that you really have no excuses right now and you just have to go do it pretty much immediately when this video ends sorry <laughs> <laughs> i need you to threaten them with something please <laughs> <laughs> it's true you have no other time but now 
know mortality is closing in the gaping maw of death let it inspire you <laughs> so. it's on the way there is no tomorrow as uh the trainer of rocky said once there is no tomorrow go and do it now harlequin grim thank you so much for coming on the uniweb interview show i definitely appreciate it man we will stay in touch i'll put links to all your information in the description of the video below where people can come and find you thanks brother thank you so much it's been fantastic my pleasure man see you bro